It had been four months. Four months of praying. Four months of waiting. Four months of planning. And now the question hung in the air. Nehemiah had been waiting that long. This man had been planning things out for that amount of time. And now he had that moment. The moment of tension was pretty strong as the king asked him that question. Why are you downcast? For a person whose job it was to not only keep the king healthy, but to keep the king happy, that could be a life sentence. That could be a capital crime. And yet, that moment passed fairly quickly. As is our, our leader, our worker, our biblical hero, as you might say, summoned up the courage and simply asked, said the question, why shouldn't I be unhappy? <laughs> my people are disgraced. My homeland is destroyed. The city of my fathers is burned. The place where their graves are is in disrepair. This is not good. And then this moment. That moment of tension passed pretty quickly, and that wondrous question was asked, what do you need? What do you want? For a king that was used to people asking him questions, used to people demanding something of him every day, he'd become pretty perceptive when someone needed or wanted something. And so he asked, what do you want? Everything kind of hung for a second. Everything was quiet for a moment. A casual observer might think that Nehemiah was standing there trying to think of what to say or how to phrase it. He'd had four months to do that. He didn't need to think about how to phrase it or what to say. He was silently praying very quickly. And then he snapped back into the reality of the moment with the king from that moment of reality with the Lord and he said send me and that's where we find him in chapter 2 it says I replied to the king O king live forever why would I not appear dejected when the city with the graves of my ancestors lies desolate and its gates destroyed by fire the king responded what is it you are seeking then I quickly prayed to the God of heaven and said to the king, If the king is so inclined and if your servant has found favor in your sight, dispatch me to Judah, to the city with the graves of my ancestors, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with his consort sitting beside him replied, How long will your trip take? And when would you return? Since the king was amenable to dispatching me, I gave him a time. I said to the king, if the king is so inclined, let him give me letters for the governors of Trans-Euphrates that will enable me to travel safely until I reach Judah, and a letter for Asaph, the keeper of the king's nature preserve, so that he will give me timber for beams, for the gates of the fortress adjacent to the temple, and for the city wall, and for the house to which I go. So the king granted me these requests, for the good hand of my God was on me. What a statement. And this is where Nehemiah goes from the planning stage to the execution stage of what the Lord has been laying on his heart for four months. Four months ago, if you remember from last week, he had received word that despite the return of exiles to Judah, despite the fact that people were finally able to go back to Israel, Jerusalem, even though the temple had been worked on and rebuilt, still sat there half empty, disgraced, and in trouble because the walls weren't rebuilt, the work that had been done had been forcibly stopped, the gates had been burned, and then he had mourned for his people. 
He had fasted. He had prayed. As we said, be careful about what you pray for. Because if you have no desire, no intention of being a part of the solution, you may be surprised. Nehemiah had an intention of being part of the solution, and the Lord guided him to it. I don't know if Nehemiah realized he would be the solution in a lot of ways, but he prayed, he planned, he figured out what it would mean. So when the king asks, asks him, what do you need, he's prepared with an answer. Look at the beginning here of chapter 2. It's where we left off, where he, the king has noticed his depression and his reply to the king is respectful, but straightforward. In verse 4, the king asks him, what are you seeking? And you'll notice his immediate response is what his response was to the bad news in the first place. Prayer. This prayer is a quiet prayer and it's a quick prayer, but it's not his first. You'll notice that he has already prepared the field. He's already been plowing the ground and getting it ready. For four months he's been doing that. He has not been idle. He had prayer of confession. He had prayers asking the Lord for deliverance for his people, for their place of residence, for God's reputation. Remember the man of God, the woman of God, has a passion for God's people and a passion for God's reputation. That has been what he has been doing. So when you look at this prayer, this is not the prayer of the unprepared student. The prayer we have all prayed at some time or other, sitting in class, staring at a test that we haven't prepped for. Please help me. This is the prayer of the person who has trained and prepared and gotten ready and waited for this moment. And now that moment is there. Thank you for this moment. Please help me. It's a whole different ballgame. So here we are. It's a quiet prayer. It's a quick prayer. It's a confirmation of his other prayers. And then he takes action. Oftentimes we reduce the Christian life to a few quick prayers. We don't have the prep time and we don't have the action afterwards. And I encourage you, this is exactly the example that we should be following. The king asks him, what do you want? So he comes up with his solution. It's a risk. He has a comfortable living in a comfortable place. He has prestige. He has the king's fear. But he doesn't say, send somebody else. Who knows how he had wrestled through this, or if he had just had the immediate desire to go. We don't know. But there was something echoing in the back of his mind. I remember studying some missionaries when I was young, and one of them, the guy couldn't get away from it. He um, didn't originally desire to be a missionary a long time ago. The risks were high, the rewards extremely low as the world looks at them. But the guy was walking through town and doing his daily business, going to bed each night, getting up each morning, and hearing the same thing over and over again in his head. People are lost. People are lost. And eventually he said, okay, Lord, I'll go. Became one of the more famous missionaries. Nehemiah is prepared to go. Going doesn't always mean missionary work. Doesn't always mean going to people who've never heard of God. In this case, Nehemiah, it means building work. As we've said, this is a regular guy. He is not the grand vizier. The empire is not royalty. He is not a priest. He's not a missionary. He's simply called by God, and he's headed toward his field. 
So what he answers, if you look at it, send me to Judah, to the city where the graves of my ancestors are, so that I can rebuild this city. You notice he doesn't mention the name of Israel, of Jerusalem, in talking about Israel. It's a clever thing. He's smart. He's not deceiving the king, but he's intelligent. The work had been forcibly stopped on the walls for a reason. Jerusalem had a history of being a stubborn, rebellious city. He names the place without naming it. He avoids the sensitive topic that might give the king pause or even cause his counselors to give negative input. He simply says, if the king is so inclined, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, dispatch me to Judah, so that to the city with the graves of my ancestors, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with his consort sitting beside him, you'll notice it's an intimate setting for a man who has an intimate ability, um, an intimate entrance into the king's life. The king has his food tasted, whether he's eating in private or at a public banquet. And he's in private. Nehemiah is uniquely placed. God will always place you uniquely where he wants you to serve. Every single person who has ever trusted in the Lord has been called to do something, and they've been put in a position to do that. Whatever that thing is, simple, small, great, or otherwise. What is the Lord calling you to? Because you'll notice you're in a unique position to serve the Lord there. You're in a unique position to impact his people. King replies, how long would your trip take and when would you return? The answer is good. The answer is positive. Now it's full speed ahead. When the Lord opens the doors, are you ready and waiting? Nehemiah is kind of like a, a track star in the blocks at the start of the race. He's been waiting, and the gun just went off. He gives the king his answer. I gave him a time. He doesn't tell us what the time is. All he says is, I gave him a time. He gave him a specific time period that he believed this could be accomplished in, from which he would return to the king's presence. And then he gives the king a list. By the way, there's a couple things I need. I need letters for the governor. I need safe passage. You know, a wandering Jew headed to Jerusalem to rebuild its walls is not a popular guy. Can you please give me safe passage through so that the governors will give way and will not interfere? Maybe will help me on my journey. And, by the way, will you give me the timber that I need to get the job done? Not too many questions can be asked if the city is being rebuilt with the king's own materials by the king's own command. In verse 8, he says, The king granted these requests, for the good hand of my God was on me. This is really the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we look at him as the hero, but what is he? He is the tool of God. God's hand is upon him. When we finished Philippians a couple weeks ago, we finished with the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That meaning is clear here. Christ had not come yet. But the role of the believer has not changed. Their relationship with God has changed through Christ being in us, saving us. But the believer has always been strengthened by God to accomplish God's purpose for what God has called them to. Like we said when we were looking at Philippians, Nehemiah knows 
He's not called to his own glory. It's not, I can do all things that I want to do. I can accomplish whatever I want to. I can be whatever I want to be because of God. No, it's, I can do whatever God has placed in my path because he is with me. There is a big difference in the philosophy and the life of the believer when we are focused on what God would have us do versus what we want. And in the case of the believer who is focused on what God would have him do, like Nehemiah, that's what he wants. You'll notice those things feed on each other. So here we are. And the story begins to get really good. I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates, in verse 9, and I presented to them the letters which the king, from the king, which the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. The king had sent troops with him. He didn't just send Nehemiah off on his own with a letter. By the way, God will never send you off on your own with a few words in your pocket. He is with you when he sends you on mission, when he puts you in place. And the king of this empire, the Median Persian Empire, has sent him with troops to back up the letter. Here we are. When Sambalot and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard all this, they were very displeased that someone had come to seek the benefit of the Israelites. And you'll notice, we begin to see the first obstacle in the way. Nehemiah is a story of a man overcoming obstacles. You could say it started when he first heard, and the obstacle was how to talk to the king. Now the obstacle, the first obstacle that he faces on his trip is these people being displeased, why does it matter? Because they're willing to back it up. Have you ever been in that position where you didn't understand why someone was opposing you, and yet they were opposing you with everything they had? Here we are. It's not going to harm these guys to see Jerusalem rebuilt, but they hate the Jews. And because they hate the Jews, they have an issue. They don't want to see it happen. Now, they don't know that that's what's happening if we continue in the next few verses. They just know that someone has come to seek the welfare of the Jews, and that is displeasing to them. They would stop it if they could. But Nehemiah comes with letters from the king and with soldiers. How can you stand against the king's soldiers? And the king's decree, you can't. So you go to your room and you sulk. And you pout and you plot. And that's what these guys do. They're officials from the local area surrounding Jerusalem whose power is being subverted by the fact that Nehemiah has been given status, he's been given position, and who dislike the Jews immensely. In verse 11, if you'll look at with me, he says, So I came to Jerusalem. When I had been there for three days, I got up during the night, along with a few men who were with me. But I did not tell anyone what my God was putting on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no animals with me except for the one I was riding. I proceeded through the valley gate by night in the direction of the well of the dragons and the dung gate, Got to love the names of these gates. Inspecting the walls of Jerusalem that had been breached and its gates that had been destroyed by fire, I passed on to the gate of the well and the king's pool, where there was not enough room for my animal to pass with me. I continued up the valley during the night, inspecting the wall. Then I turned back and came to the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had been doing. For up to this point, I had not told any of the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or the rest of the workers. He had not revealed to anyone what God had sent him to do. He had it all written in a letter. He had all the official stuff. 
but he did not tell anyone. You'll notice another emphasis in the life of the Christian, the follower, the believer, who is following after God. The believer does not go and, and brag on themselves. He is recognizing the hardships ahead of him, and he's planning it out. He's been doing this the whole time. We were having a discussion a couple nights ago with somebody about blind faith. And there is a certain amount of blindness to faith. You take a leap and you jump and you check something out. You try something new. You take a risk. But at the same time, Nehemiah isn't just blundering around with the idea that he's going to simply walk in the door and everything's going to fall in place. He's been planning. We talk about counting the cost of the tower in the New Testament. A man does not build a tower unless he counts the cost. Proverbs speaks to this as well. Only the foolish person approaches a project without thinking it through. Let me ask you this. Are you intentional in your living? Are we intentional as Christians? As believers? Are we intentional in our relationship with Christ and knowing Him? Are we intentional in our love for Him? Are we intentional in sharing Him with other people? Because if we don't ever plan anything out, we're basically expecting God to carry the load while we just kind of float by instead of joining in the work that he has appointed to us. There's a big difference between trying to carry the load ourselves and simply joining where he is putting us. You'll notice Nehemiah joins where God has put him, where God has placed him, what God has done for him. The hand of the Lord is with him. And crazily enough, the hand of the Lord was with him for all four months while he was sitting there waiting, planning, thinking it through. The hand of the Lord was with him in that tension, in that moment when he requested from the king what he needed. And now the hand of the Lord is with him as he sends him. And the hand of the Lord is not unintelligent. Nehemiah is not taking stupid risks. He's not walking in and declaring his intention to everybody. He knows there will be opposition, and so he's planning for it. He's planning, knowing that he's going to be opposed. So, when you're going to be opposed, do you tell people what you're going to do? Not necessarily. He's not being dishonest, he's just being intelligent. Ronald Reagan once said that he had something very, very, very important to let people know, so he was going to keep it a secret. He said, if I tell you all right now, it's not going to matter. I'm just going to keep it a secret and then leak it. Because as you know, Washington, D.C. leaks like a sieve, and everything that's leaked is what gets reported in the newspaper. Here we are. He's not precisely going to keep it a secret and, and only let it come out in, in, bit by bit in secret later, but he has planned and he knows what the opposition is. He knows who stopped the work earlier, and he knows who will try to stop it again. Do you plan for your obstacles, but hand them over to the Lord? It's one of the hardest things to do, I think. My temptation would have been to come up with a good plan and somehow sabotage those guys. It's not Nehemiah's plan. His plan is to do the wor work that the Lord has appointed him to, but he knows who these people are, and he knows that they don't need to know until they need to know. He also knows that he needs to finish the exact plans of how the work needs to be done before he presents it to the people. You know, when we talk about church leadership, 
We talk about being transparent. And yet, you know, when you have especially a large church, do you include everyone in on every meeting? No. Because when you have a plan for something, you want to present that finished product to the church so that people can take a look at it and either buy in or not. You know, there's nothing under the table, but did you include them on the process? Not necessarily. Same thing in a business. You're not going to tell the business plan to the lowliest worker until you actually have a plan. And that's what Nehemiah does. He has not seen this city before. So he goes out by night in secret. He's not going to start the debate on how it's going to be done until he's ready to tell people what the plan is. Smart guy. Nehemiah is a practical believer. He looks at the situation. He sizes it up. He prays about it. He presents it to the Lord. He thinks it through, and he attacks the problem as the Lord gives him the opportunity and provides. Think about that. Is that how your life proceeds? I look at Nehemiah, and I am usually pretty embarrassed. I think his sock drawer and mine would probably look completely different. Because I have a feeling he was a little OCD, and his would be organized. Whereas mine looks more like an explosion went off in a sock factory. And I'm always searching, where's my other sock? I think it's because my sons steal them out of the laundry, but you know. Either that or the dryer eats them, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's how it goes, isn't it? Be an intentional believer, I encourage you. As we go through Nehemiah, we will begin to see the obstacles build. And in a way, his story is one of overcoming obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And the Lord paves the way each time, but there are practical steps he takes in his life every time. He's a practical guy. He's a blue-collar kind of guy. And he's a worker. And he's been called to do work. He has been called to do a reestablishment of the temple, necessarily. He hasn't been called to be a priest. I emphasize again and again, he's been called to do work. Why? Because that's where most of us live in this life. There are a few of us that, you know, we take a title. And it bears a lot of responsibility, but that title might be missionary, pastor, or whatever. And it's kind of funny because we tend to look at people from a certain point of view spiritually. Oh, you're a, you know, that doesn't matter. If you're a believer, you have work to do. And you'll find that most of the work of the Lord is done quietly by those living their lives practically. And that's where this is. That's where we find Nehemiah. He came before that you might follow, that I might follow, and that we might see. I encourage you. Be encouraged by this guy, by what he does, by the practical steps that he takes. And a big part of that is submitting it to the Lord and planning it out. And then not being dissuaded when it comes up. He's now executing the plan. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful example of the man of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for examples. Lord, we thank you that Nehemiah was um, willing to take a risk that he was willing to execute the plan. That he was willing to see obstacles that were coming up. 
And Lord, that you gave him the solution to those obstacles that he was willing to take them on. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to do the same. And I pray that whatever your calling is, whatever those obstacles may be, you would give your people strength. Strength and the willingness to overcome. And Father, we thank you for recording this so that we can be encouraged. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.